Cool. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, to the, I don't. I think it's like the second or third office hours. I don't even know at this point, but uh, it's like seventh or eighth uh, full meeting too. So welcome back. Um, and yeah, uh, I think Yasir is just repositioning, so he'll be joining in a second. And Crystal couldn't make it uh, this evening, so we will be answering and fielding your questions and all that together today. So yeah, so uh, looking at the canvas, I, I was just going to look at some of the comments that were posted, and we can go over them uh, a little bit. Oh, looks like we got some more people joining. Hit them. Oh, uh, let's see. So, looks like some of the just kind of general themes that we can touch up on are someone was talking about how they're connecting, um, wondering the connection also into resilience hubs, like how do battery collectives and battery uh, collectives fit into the idea of a resilience hub. And I think that's a very common thing that we've seen and as we're seeing the community at large talks about and it makes makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a very obviously good overlap and connection there, right? If you're able to get either support through a community center that is designated as a uh, resilience hub, um, you, can, you know, you can tap in and have that as a place where you can store the batteries and where uh, members can share access to that communal place and actually be able to rely on those batteries being there. So yeah, uh, in our experience, being able to put them into resilience hubs is a great combination because again, it's already a area, a local area where people are trying to coordinate and facilitate uh, cooperation together. So yeah, I mean, um, I think that's a great idea. I saw somebody posted that. I think it all a... starts somewhere. Yeah. Welcome Yasir. Peace. Um, so yeah, so that was one question that was fielded and was talked about as how someone's, what they're planning to do. And we'll actually probably have a little segment today for people to talk about how that's going, how their journey <laughs> with starting their own battery collective, whether that's just talking with people or starting to organize, starting to gather resources um, is going. Um, there's also been a lot of questions or a couple questions, I won't say a lot. Um, around how more specifically, how can we deal as a collective or a group of people trying to arrive at decisions, especially as decisions become more critical or complicated, whether it be funding or um, whatever the question would be. As we've always talked about, it always depends on your community is the first thing I'm always gonna say. <laughs> Everyone's different. The way that you wanna go about making decisions in your community with your group of people, uh, can vary, but I mean, people are asking, so I will we'll just briefly talk about some quick governing techniques that I think I've seen work personally um, in our either battery collective or greater collectives, and just point you at some resources to help you explore what kind of decision-making processes, governance structures you might want to explore. So the thing I'm gonna be basically referring to and talking mostly about is the model of sociocracy. Like, like socialocracy, I guess. So social democracy. Uh, if you start looking up that term, you'll see a lot of um, information and resources on that. So that, I think just looking for that term can help you kind of get into the right domain of like kind of scoping how you want to approach your collective gover governance and or decision making. It's kind of both of these. They have a lot of resources on small and large groups. And it's focused on distributing um, tasks uh, to different what they call circles or pods, depending on how you want to read it. But that's just a brief overview of that. So if you look down that, you can learn more. The things that I think are important that just from broad concepts are you usually want to try to have consent building, a consent building process, which is uh, an area where everyone can address a have an area to present a proposal and then you take turns for everyone that's part that wants to participate to be able to critique on if they consent and one of the big things about consent uh, that people 
if you don't practice it a lot, people think is, well, like, how are you going to build consensus? One, it's, it is, it does take practice in a methodology. So one, I would encourage you to pra practice it and explore for yourself. And again, these resources will talk about all, a lot of different mitigation techniques or not mitigation, but even just uh, compromising, you know, mutual agreement techniques that you can use to help come up with creative solutions that you may not have uh, thought were there. And again, one of the things with cons consent building is the idea that you may not love the idea, like you may not may think it's the best idea, but um, oh, we got some, no worries. Um, but you always have the power to object to an idea. But the idea is, is that it's like a, and this comes in practice and understanding. Uh, it's like a reserve power, um, and you only want to do it if you think it's like opposes you like morally or is absolutely against the objective of the collective itself. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is that when you do these rounds and you're talking in these consent circles, consent building circles, you have the space to address your concerns with what the proposal is. And this provides space for people to talk about possible alternatives to the proposal that may um, resolve that uh grievance that has been brought up by the participant. And again, as I said, there's lots of information on this, but some just quick ones are things like even just putting a time cap on a decision, saying we'll try this for a month and right and then we'll come back and we will reassess how it went. And if, you know, and you usually want to have something that's quantifiable. So it's like, oh, like we tried this people didn't get like in their case didn't or did get the batteries or people felt like it was unjust that they got the like the way the batteries were distributed and now you have you're actually trying things you're not held up by people um not having something to implement but people got to address their concern and then you collectively came up with a way to test it and now you can verify was this the way that we want to approach as a collective that's just an example, time capping. There's a whole bunch of other mechanisms and ways of thinking about problems and just the way people are naturally creative will come up with um, how to merge ideas and solutions and consensus. Again, based on, and a lot of this by doing this, it is really based on your community because everyone will be thinking about different priorities, um, different concerns. Anyway, um, look up sociocracy. Uh, the, I think there's a group called Sociocracy for All, just like sociocracyforall.org, com. Plenty of resources. It's for free. They're a, so they're a organization that is also they use their own format, and they produce. They have, so it's very cool. It's cool to see uh, people using it and delegating responsibilities, but also embodying the practices that they're trying to talk about. So like they even have like their own marketing circle, for example, or, you know, um, PR circle that does all of this stuff and it creates videos. So it shows how the flexibility of when problems arise, sometimes you might even just make new groups or new collectives or however you want to think of it um, to solve that problem. And you don't have to concern the larger group and delegation of concerns are addressed. And anyway, something to explore <laughs> and um, experiment with for sure. Um, so that was another one on, um, that we saw, I guess I'll pause here. I'm sorry. I just been, I jumped in here and have been, uh, kind of ranting at you guys. Is there any questions? Yeah. Sarah, did you want to add anything before uh, there's another question we can go over? Whatever. Mm, nope. Not that I can, well, just, uh, in general, I think. Just reminding people of every community is uh, different. So, um, yeah, your community is going to be how you and the individuals in your community choose to set it up. But this is a, a good resource that you've dropped in the in the chat there. Hopefully, people can get some benefit from it. <laughs> Clarify some of the questions that that they have around that. I think uh, Robin hands up. Can we get like a uh, like a sheet or a fact sheet that you're using to um, kind of like have an outline for our own use that be included? Um, I think actually there's like, I, I we actually built, there's actually on this website, there's a, um, there's a great link. I, I'll link it in a second here. 
I think we literally just copied that text and saved it into our own drive just for future use because I thought it was pretty good, but it still lives on their website. Um, I will link that. I think it just it's kind of talks about all these high points and paints them out. So, yeah. So I will link that. Um, hey. so, yep. Hello. Hello. Yeah, so this is Robin. I'm in Orlando, Florida. So I guess, and you may be answering it, but um, as like we're coming up on another possible scare, I'm wondering, you know, how we can utilize what we've learned because uh, another person from Orlando has been on the calls too. Rachel, how can we start our collective here? Is there a chance of, also is there a chance of us, even though we're not, in the California area of maybe having a battery packet sent to us, or I, I, I don't know, you know, um, because there's another one, there's a, another storm out in the, um, the Atlantic now and the area that I live in, or I'm close to, we were really impacted by in on last, on, on this time last year. So we just definitely want to be prepared. Yeah. Um, I guess, Tom, did you want to talk about the yeah. the packet stuff? Sure. Yeah, I can jump in there real quick. So um, we are going to be sending out batteries to everybody that finishes the process, this program. Um, and the steps to be able to, to receive that are participation in these sessions. Um, and then what we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end uh, and and this is going to be, end up being the homework between now and next session is to um, basically create a, a launch plan outline for your network. And so that's going to be the homework over the next week. Um, once we get all those, those outlines in following next week's session, which will be our last session. So this is the penultimate one today. Um, we will then be sending out a, a, a battery request form to everybody who finishes the program, uh, you know, with, names, places, dresses, all the whole deal. Um, and then we'll be getting those sent out. So we're probably at least three weeks away from a physical battery showing up in your community. Thank you for that. That And then, Thanks. Uh, yeah. And then specific, you also, I mean, if you honestly think it's a pressing emergency, I mean, we encourage you to, you know, start talking to those people, start talking to your local auto body shops. Uh, again, like if you really just want to get somewhere like we did, just you can get those refurbished or old lead acid batteries and just <laughs> start start getting the parts together. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I if you, it's a good way to go <laughs> to just get something going, so. Thank yeah, you. so I, I dropped in chat um, a little, uh, uh, what do you call that? It's it's called the DIY solar setup, easy to follow step by step instructions. I don't, I can't contest on how easy it is to follow, but it's a pretty short, straightforward video. Um, it shows you the components that we've talked about. Um, shows you how to connect those components that we've talked about um, during these sessions. So for the individuals who are interested in. Uh, setting up a, a backup battery supply. This is a, an, an easy kind of um, guide. Um, so this one's solar charged. Uh, you can get them that are solar charged. You can also get them that are, you know, plug into on-grid electrical power when it's available to charge them up as well. Um, we are actually going to be doing, uh, building some batteries this weekend. We're hoping to record the session and if that works out, we'll be able to share that with the group here next um, next Tuesday uh, or be able to post it so people have access to it thereafter. Um, sorry, I'm looking in chat at the same time. That's just an AI thing. So <laughs> the thing that I wanted to share with everyone also is that so as we're ge gearing up and saying, hey, we need to build these batteries for um, there's a... Uh, 
there's a community out here who does a, what's called a pop-up village. So they have like community resources once a month that they give back to the community where they have um, uh, dental care, prenatal care, postnatal care, postpartum care, like all these wonderful things for um, the community and really kind of geared toward moms and children of the community, which is really nice. So, but they have this outdoor event where they shut down a block every month. Um, and they have like a DJ, they have medical resources that come in. We've been using uh, the battery, the batteries in their spare time or when they're not being used for, for emergencies to help power this event, to get them off of generators and so forth. So we're at the point now where we're gonna build batteries for them so we don't have to transport them there. We've been doing it for maybe two months. So we're gonna do a battery build just to educate the community on how to how to build their own backup batteries. And also those batteries will be housed and stay with this particular community when we're done. Um, in preparation for that, I'll just share with everyone kind of our thought process and what, what we're going through here. Uh, so my first step is uh, Craigslist. So I'm on Craigslist and then I type in uh, whatever type of batteries I'm gonna use. So let's say we're using lithium batteries. I type in, you know, lithium batteries and it's gonna pull up a search for all the lithium batteries in my area that are for sale. Some of them are new, some of them are used. Um, I did this a couple of days ago and I think what I came up with was um, there is not too close to us, but not too far away. It's about an hour away south. There's a city called Gilroy. Uh, in Gilroy, they have, um, I think we discussed this before. So just by chance, they have, um, if anyone's ever been like to the ER, or to the hospital, the um, the nurses have this cart and the doctors do too. They have a cart that has a monitor on it and they have a, a, a laptop docking station where they can dock their laptop. And they unplug it from one room and then they go to the next room, they plug it back in and type some stuff. And sometimes they have like little printers attached and so forth to, to take uh, people's vitals and so forth. Those carts have, um, have lithium ion batteries on them. They're 12 volt, 50 amp hour batteries, uh, which are really nice. Um, they go, when they switch those out, they go based off of the time frame that they've been in service. They don't go by like the capacity of the battery or how many cycles the battery has. It's let's say every year we're required to swap this out. Uh, for instance, every year they're going to swap those out and put new ones in there. So that battery may be at 10% of its life cycle. It may be at 20% of its life cycle. Um, but if we look at the application where they're going to plug that in one room, roll to another room, plug it into the other room, um, that's a very the amount of time that that actual battery is being used is very low. Um, so it has a, when you get them used, they still have a very high life expectancy. So those are like very premier batteries to try to snag. So the ones here, they're in Gilroy. Um, they're asking $150 for the entire unit, the rolling cart and everything. So we don't need the cart, of course, we're just looking for the actual batteries but $150 for a 12 volt, 50 amp hour battery that's lithium is a great, great deal. So um, buying them new, we'd probably be spending about twice that amount. Um, and then if we got a hundred amp hour battery, sometimes they're like three, maybe $400. So to be able to get a 50 amp hour battery, which we could just take two of those um, and tie them together. And that would give us a 12 volt, a hundred amp hour battery. Um, which is kind of exactly what we're looking for for this particular project. So, um, yeah, we're going to try to pick those up this week sometime. So that's the first thing that we look for is the the largest component or the most, usually the most expensive component. Um, the next thing that we're going to look for um, is going to be a way to charge it. So we're going to get a, a, a charge controller. So what the charge controller does is it regulates... Uh, I don't know if we should be dropping these in chat, the components or no. Um, we we can. All right, battery. I think we've already mentioned these, but just in case, the yeah. battery. Yeah. So we want to be able to control the charge to that battery. So that's called a charger, and sometimes it's called a charge controller. Um, so that just says 
I have voltage coming in that needs to be controlled and delivered to my battery at 12 volts. And there's a little piece of equipment that does that. So we'll be looking for a charge controller next. Um, after we find a charge controller, we're going to need, uh, what's next? Uh, uh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we'll do charge controller. Anyone take notes before when we were doing this? I'm really curious. Because this is most of this stuff is just repetition, but I'm just really curious if anyone's been paying attention. I guess might be the right right comment. It's like somebody put inverter in the chat. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, inverter. Does anyone know what the other components are? Inverter. Inverter. I'm happy everyone's saying inverter. That's a good thing. So um, very nice. Thank you. Yes, people are paying attention. I feel much better. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next component, the inverter. Um, so what the inverter is going to do is allow us to take that stored um, energy that's inside of the battery and to use that. Uh, we're going to take that and say, uh, take that 12 volts, 100 amp hours, and be able to convert it to, of DC, be able to convert it to AC power. So we can plug in alternating current appliances, which it's about 50-50 in a household, what's alternating current, what's direct current. A lot of the things that we think are alternating current are actually direct current, um, such as a laptop. A lot of people are like, I plug that into the wall. This is alternating current. Your laptop has a battery, a rechargeable battery in there, which means it's actually direct current. Um, and the way that our relation is with energy and the way that the energy system works here, we waste a lot of energy. So we take alternating current and we convert that to direct current to power our, our laptop. So we're using 20% more power than we would use if it was just direct current to direct current. And at 20%, gets wasted in converting it from AC to DC. So just something to keep in mind, if you guys have a DC component, try to charge it with DC. Um, if you convert it, and sometimes you have systems like solar, you take it from DC um, and you may convert it to AC right away, or you may convert it to DC, sorry, DC to like a battery, battery storage and then AC to discharge. Every time you do a conversion, you're you're wasting about 20%, just kind of as a general frame of reference. Um, but we want to get our inverter. We talked about before about how to size um, the inverter. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. So the type of inverter or the size of the inverter, it's going to be rated at a certain wattage. So you'll have a 1,000 watt inverter. You might have a 2,000 watt inverter. You might have a 3,000 watt inverter. And you're trying to figure out like, hey, which one do I need? This goes back to when we were talking about um, how to size. Sorry, Robert, I'm going to mute you unless you have something to say. Right now. I know you have something to say, but right at this moment, sorry. Um, so the sizing of the inverter. Yes, we talked about... Um, looking at your appliances and the things that you're using and how to look at those and add them up to see how much, what, what your wattage is gonna be, that's gonna be your demand. This is how much I need. Um, so that will size your inverter. So if I look at my house and I'm like, I have lights that I wanna power and I have 10 lights and all the 10 lights are three watts each because they're LED lights. So I'm gonna need 30 watts for lighting. Um, and then I look and I say, I have a refrigerator. My refrigerator takes you know, 1500 watts. So I'm going to need, you know, what was our first number? 30 plus 1500. So uh, 1530. And then on top of that, I'm going to need, I don't know, what's another appliance? A CPAP machine. My CPAP machine is 120 watts. So you're going to basically do a sizing when you size all those things, and you're going to have a, a wattage that you come out with. Um, and I'm giving you guys the skinny because the video will probably go into more detail about that. So you'll have your wattage and you'll say, great, I need uh, uh, 1,900 watts. And you'll look and you'll say, oh, look, there's an inverter here. It's a 2,500 watt inverter or it's a 2,000 watt inverter that will handle my demand. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and get that one. 
So that inverter will take care of your energy demand based off of what you calculate your energy demand to be. Um, that's a very important step. Um, when you do off-grid solar sizing, it's like one of the major steps that they do to size your inverter based off of, they usually just use your PG&E bill for that because your PG&E bill has what your monthly consumption is um, and people's behavior doesn't change. Uh, so you'll have, it's going to be based off of whatever we have, they have on record, PG&E has on record that they give you for your bill that you're paying for. It'll say, this is your consumption. And you'll look at that and you'll go, I don't consume that much. I'll change. And they'll say, no, we need to sell you this really expensive inverter because this is your consumption and it's, it's not going to change. Trust them, it's not going to change. So go ahead and get the inverter. That's the right size. That way, when you use it, um, one, you don't pop the fuse and two, it's going to actually supply the amount of power that you need. Um, so we're just going to get for our system here, since it's just going to be an off grid system, it's powering. Um, one of them is going to power like a DJ that's going to be there. We have another one that powers a school bus that's there. Uh, it powers the lighting on the school bus. It powers all the laptops that are plugged in on the school bus, all the monitors that are plugged in on the school bus. Um, and then there's another one that does a second stage um, at the same same venue where there's a presentation stage where people do demonstrations for uh, eating healthy. So there's like a health food demonstration. They go over um, uh, how to... One, how to approach your, your pantry, how to look at your pantry, how to look at the foods in your pantry. And then it also goes over like uh, the health benefits for the individual and also goes over how to prepare things. Um, so there's like a lot of uh, new vegetables or new foods that are introduced to people's vocabularies, um, which is one thing to introduce people to new food. It's another thing to share with them how to prepare the food and how to actually utilize that. Uh, kind of similar to the work that we're doing here. So um, we're just doing a thousand watt inverters. We might have one that's a 2000 watt, but it'd be a thousand watt inverter for the systems is what we're looking for. So same, same idea. We go into Craigslist, we type in inverter, someone's selling an inverter somewhere. So once someone wants to get rid of one, we need one, uh, and we'll buy that secondhand. Um, there's also other websites that people can get stuff and shop for stuff. It's not only Craigslist, but. Craigslist is a communal site, which is um, usually a nice communal site. I think there's uh, other community ones, but I'm not too hip on them. Um, if you guys know of them, you guys can post them in a the chat. There might be other ones in your area. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Free Cycle. Uh, there's a neighborhood one. I forget what the neighborhood one is. There's, um, there's just different sites. Uh, I mean... I'm trying to stay away from like the eBay and trying to stay away from like the Amazon um, just because at the end of the day, the, the, the footprint of getting that material to you is, is really uh, amazing. Um, thank you everyone who's posting. Um, so yeah, uh, an inverter. And then what's our next component? Solar, somebody put solar in the thing, wires, cables. I'll go over wire cables probably at the end. Um, so let's say solar. So I'm going to take solar as a way to charge. So we need a, a source to charge that battery. So we have a battery. We have an inverter. Um, inverter is going to be out. So that's energy leaving the system goes through the inverter. Energy coming into the system goes through the charge converter. Energy that stays in the system is the battery. So now we're talking about the where the energy comes from. So that energy source coming into the system can be solar, uh, or it can also be um, uh, like AC voltage. You can plug it into the wall and charge it up. So, and your charge controller needs to be, it's gonna be based off of if it's coming from solar, a DC source, or if it's coming from, um, uh, alternating current source, such as plugging it into the wall. So that will tell you what type of charge controller you're going to get. I want one. There's some that do both. So you can get a um, one that takes solar input and one that also takes some um, AC input. That's going to be a solar panel, in essence, is going to get plugged into your charge converter. 
So when the sun's out, the solar rays hit the solar panel. It takes that energy and it transfers it into the wires. Those wires are now hooked up to your charge controller, which cleans up the energy. It makes it so when it comes through there, it's it can be delivered at 12 volts and your battery doesn't get a shock. It's like um, not necessarily dipping your toe in the water, but acclimating your temperature before you hop in the water. So there's no shock to the system. The battery charges up. After the battery charges up, now you need to use that um, that energy, which we're talking about shock. We should probably go into the inverter. I'm going to back up one step and go back to the inverter. Um, there's two types of inverters um, that you'll see that are very common. One is called a um, pure sine wave, pure sine inverter, and the other one is called a modified inverter. Um, Kind of the skinny of that is try to get the pure sign. It's it's closer. It's a lot closer to what you plug into normally inside of your house. So if you're using it to operate anything with a motor or anything that has a constant demand, the pure sign will be able to provide that constant demand um, regulated. So you're going to get a, a, a constant frequency with the pure sign versus a modified sign. Uh, you won't get that. It's uh, abbreviated. So um, if you're using like a power drill or something like that, you may need to plug in there. Or again, anything with the motor, it's going to change the weight at that, um, the vibration of that much. Vibration, I don't know if I like that word for a, an inanimate object, object, but it's going to change the way that the, the motor responds to that. So just look for a, a pure sine wave inverter if you guys are looking for inverters, just to make it extremely easy. Um, that's going to do what you guys needed to do. Um, it's more compatible with uh, more things as well. So back to the charge controller. Any questions so far? This is somewhat battery type, but sorry, there's a long. Um... Okay, that was a reply to Alice. So. There's a, a lot of information um, online about how to wire things in parallel. Or um, So as far as wiring, you guys can just Google it. It's going to be there. Um, there's just uh, ultimately there's two ways to, to daisy chain batteries together. So you can wire if you have a 12 volt. I think I said earlier that they, these people are selling 12 volt, 50 amp hour batteries. Um, at the end of the day, we want to have um, 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries, which means we need to buy two batteries. Depending on how we wire those, we can either have um, 24 volts at 50 amp hours, which we don't want, or we can have uh, 12 volts at 100 amp hours. So that's a very easy Google. So I'm not going to go into details about that. It's how you hook up your positive and negative terminals. So don't don't get too caught up on that. <laughs> um, just uh, just Google it. So, and if I told you, you wouldn't remember. <laughs> so, um, what's the other thing? Am I missing something? Solar coming in, charge controller. For my charge controller, I'm going to go to my battery. For my battery, I'm going to go to my inverter. For my inverter, I'm going to go to whatever I'm going to plug into um, to my inverter, the power. Um, it's going to get into wiring, but I think Eugene's going to tell me I'm missing something. What's up, Eugene? <laughs> I was going to ask you about wiring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank what, you very much. What size of wiring? Okay. So wiring, um, when we get into wiring sizes, I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible for everyone. So we talked before about how to get the wattage um, in our calculations. So you're going to do the same thing to get the amperage for your application. So when we did the math um, for everything, when we went over batteries, we went over how to get the wattage and we also went over how to get the amperage. So once you figure out what your amperage is, you're gonna size your wires based off of your amperage. So if I'm using uh, 20 amps, I do my calculations and I'm like, oh, it's 20 amps or 18 amps or whatever it's gonna be. Um, I'm going to say that that's going to be 12 gauge wiring. 
if I say, oh, it's 15 amps, I'm going to say, okay, that's 14 gauge wiring. If I go, oh, it's 50 amps, I'm going to say 50 amps is eight gauge wiring. Um, and all the wiring is going to be for um, sh what are called short runs. So runs that are under 50 feet in length. So, and when you get over 50 feet, then that's when the, it changes. But you guys are going to Google, and this is a, another very easy thing to Google. You're going to Google um, uh, whatever your amperage is. Let's say it's 20 amps. You're going to say 20 amps wire size. And Google is going to have a form that comes up that's an electrical form. Very easy to read. Uh, if I could share a screen, I would with you guys. But um, it's just going to be a form that's going to pop up. And it's just going to say, if you're if it's uh, 20 amps, you need uh, uh, 14, no, excuse me, 12 gauge uh, cable. Um, if it's, you know, 50 amps, you need eight gauge cable or six gauge. It'll give you like two different types. But that's how you're going to determine what your wire size is going to be. Um, and I'm trying to think that wire size is going to be consistent throughout your system. The main place you have to concentrate on that is going to be from your input. So if I have, let's say, 10 solar panels that are all tied together and those 10 solar panels are putting out uh, you know, 50 amps, then I'm going to gauge that wire between my solar panels and my charge controller to be appropriate, from my charge controller to my batteries to be the same, and from my batteries to my inverter to be the same. So um, I think Tom just dropped a chart. Let's take a look at it real quick uh, into the chat. I didn't find the one you're talking about, but I found another one that has a matching of amp size. Okay. If you click on that, scroll down just a little bit. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, that works well. Yeah, 12 gauge is 20 amps, 14 gauge is 15 amps, 10 gauge is 30 amps, 8 gauge is 40. Yeah. So information like this uh, is very easy to Google. So that's why we don't, I don't try to spend a lot of time on it. But, um, but yes, that one works. The one that uh, Tom just dropped into the chat will show you the wire sizes that you need. Um, where to get wiring from? Uh, again, Craigslist is always a good place. Um, sometimes people use like old extension cords. Like if you have an extension cord that doesn't work anymore and you know the wire gauge size of the extension cord, that's a, another option there. Um, other options for wire... I'll ask the team. Anyone have any other options for how to how to go about getting wire? Those are the two that come to mind that are pretty straightforward. Wouldn't you just to go to like an appliance place because they throw a lot of stuff out, like you know, and I would just like glean from them, you know, and then like all your all your thrift stores because they get a lot of stuff that um they throw out, and like I would just like go there and pick that up and then strip it because you know, then you have the wires. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very, very, very good one. Uh, uh, last time I went to Goodwill, actually, they had um, dr a dryer wire there, which is six gauge dryer wire. They're selling it for a dollar fifty, or uh, whatever it was, six feet of it, which is dirt cheap. You can't buy for that. So, and that one one length of wire depends on how large your setup is. Uh, large, I mean horizontal space it takes can probably do the entire thing for your entire um, your entire setup. Theater shops, events, production shops might have them. Thank you. Um, and there's also a two determined wire gauges for a couple of dollars at the hardware store. Yes, so they they have um, wire gauge sizing tools. So if you have let's say an old extension cord and you're like I don't know how large this is and you can take this tool. If it fits through the hole, it, you know, whichever one it fits to the most snug would be that wire gauge. So, yes, there's also a calculator online that let's say you have them and it's too small. They'll tell you how many like 12 gauges you need to twist together to get something larger. But again, wire is one of one of the components that's probably going to be the, the least expensive uh, component that you purchase. And, you know, uh, one other place that I would recommend is like the high schools because you have all the like electric and science and all that. And they throw away so much stuff because they don't use it. 
And those that would be probably what you'd find in those um, like electrical classes and things. They don't they don't save everything. They throw a lot of stuff away because that, that's how I've been able to get like parts to the computers that I sometimes put together um, from the schools. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, and Meredith uh, mentioned that uh, extension cords have um, rat poison mixed into the, the the jackets surrounding the wires to keep creatures from chomping on the wires. So just a heads up there. Um, thank you, everyone, for the. I'll just leave them in the chat. There's other other um, options here for getting wire. The the one of the major uh, ways to get a lot of these also is if you know anyone who works at Home Depot and you have the Home Depot hookup, they okay. throw away like all of this stuff they throw away. So there'll be stuff that's like an inverter that's the package is open or got it goes into trash. There's a, a pack of wire, like uh, electrical wire that has a hole in it or is damaged in some way. It goes into trash. There's a giant dumpster that sits behind Home Depot, which is a gold mine, um, but they don't let people into that. You just have to make sure you find a, a good contact at the store. So you make baked goods, good place to spend your baked goods. <laughs> Uh, yes, Eugene. Um, places like uh, big box stores, here we have Menards, but probably Lowe's does it too. They, If they have odd sizes, odd lengths of wire that was cut to sell to a customer, maybe like six feet left over, they'll sell that at a cheaper price by the foot. Nice. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, they uh, not sound like a broken record, but the other one, so like you might be like, well, where are we going to get solar panels? So in my, literally in my personal experience, but, and yours would be different, but just the power of people and talking about like finding hookups and things. So in my area, I, I put out a flyer, like we're looking for, you know, to start this battery collective in this group. And somebody came out, came out and just said that they worked at Tesla and that they just had a whole bunch of, uh, dummy test uh, solar panels that they were just going to throw away. So similar thing. We got a hundred, we just had to show up with a big box truck. We got a hundred solar panels for free. So uh, like use one time. So like there's opportunities out there. So again, just talking to people can sometimes create opportunities to resources that you would never even have known admit like existed like i never knew it makes sense that like home depot also has similar things going on right with wood and other accessories so thank you for that um speaking of solar panels uh yeah same thing craigslist and then i like kansas's way just networking to try to figure it out um so there was something about how many solar panels i think to charge up the batteries so if we had a 12 volt um, battery, um, and let's say it's a thousand watt battery is what we have. And we were trying to figure out, well, how many solar panels do we need to charge that? Which is kind of a common question. It's kind of an interesting question too, but it depends on a few things. So the first variable is the size of your solar panel. How many watts is your solar panel putting out? So let's say your solar panel is putting out 200 watts. So some people are, under the impression that, okay, 200 watts my solar panel is putting out, I have a thousand watt battery I need to charge, that means I need five solar panels, right? Five, five, 10, 15. So if you guys remember before when we talked about watts and we talked about the measurement of the watts, we were, we were saying that this is what's called watt hours. So I would get five solar panels if I wanted to have that battery charged in one hour. So five solar panels will give me a thousand watts in one hour. So if I were like in a rush, I need to charge this battery up in one hour. If I'm not in a rush, I can I can take that one solar panel, that 200 watt solar panel, and it will charge up that 1000 watt uh, battery. It's just gonna take uh, five times the amount of time. So it would take five hours for one panel to do it. Five panels would take one hour to do, if that makes sense. So, and that's minus the 20% that we talked about already about how you lose um, uh, the conversion, the wires take a little bit. So it's not an exact number. It's a, it's a ballpark number, just so everyone understands that. So um, 
I'm saying that to say some people get caught up going, I need to get five panels. You don't need to get this, whatever you have. If you have one panel, great, start with one panel. Um, when you get a second panel, you can add that second panel to the system. It's going to charge it, you know, possibly twice as fast. When you're, but when you're getting solar panels, uh, the other thing people get caught up on is, especially if they're getting them aftermarket or just grabbing what they can get, um, they'll get caught up on, oh, I have one solar panel that's 200 watts. I have another solar panel that's 400 watts. Um, I can't use those together. So you can use them together. It's just going to have, you're going to be losing wattage, basically. It's going to go to whatever the default, to whatever the lowest uh, wattage of the system is. So you can tie them together to both DC. They're they're both putting out the same thing. It's just, just going to have the lower wattage. So you'll be wasting that Um in a situation where that we're talking about 200 and 400 watts, it wouldn't make sense. You would just hook up the 400 watt one because you're actually losing 200 watts. So you just would not use the 200 watt versus hooking them both up. Um, but I'm just trying to make sure everyone understands the premise of it so they can take that premise and then expand on it um, offline. And hopefully somebody's taking some notes somewhere. I'll pause for questions. And then we'll probably hand it off to Tom. So yeah, yeah. I just wanted to. I think it's a good call out. Just talking about really quickly the function, the hundred percent functioning versus like degre degradation. I guess if I can say that right, of the the panels, uh, people do rotate them out, even though they're still working, right? They're just not working at a hundred percent efficiency like they used to. So that's a good call out. You that's another thing to consider. You may have to have more panels, but. I mean, if if you need them in a crisis, right? You're getting energy. That's energy that's being produced. So, I have a question. Um, so I have like eight solar panels that were left over from a job, and my son just brought them home. And I was like, "What am I going to do with this?" You know? And he's like, "Just keep them. We might need them." And I'm like, "All right." So I put them away. And heck, I don't know how to read them. Do they have something written on the outside of them that will like? allow me to be able to like define what kind of panel it is. Are there different types of panels that, that can be used And like, um, is there any, is there any kind of dangerous thing? Because like, I've never really touched a solar panel before and it's sitting there and I'm kind of like, don't touch it, you know, because I don't know what it does. <laughs> so, and if I'm able to do something with it, cause if, if I can make like a grid, you know, for the community, that's like a source of energy. Right. So, yeah. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'll drop in chat. Um, I just YouTube like how to read a solar panel. But yes, uh, every solar panel. And when I say every solar panel, every solar panel usually comes with the sticker. Sometimes they, you may not see one. Sometimes, uh, you know, it may be faded. It may be gone. It may be somebody may have removed it or scratched it off. But usually it's on the back of the panel um, and it will have the the things that you're looking for, it has the voltage, the output voltage of it. Um, it has the output current of it, the amperage. It has the um, the the basic solar panel. So you'll have like a 400 watt solar panel. It'll say 400 watts, and then you'll read the back sticker, and it tells you the amperage that it's pushing that out at. It'll show you the the wattage, the actual wattage. It'll show you the voltage that it's going to generate. The things that you're concerned about. Um, the main things you're concerned about is is basically the wattage and the voltage that it's going to push it out at. There's a 12 volt solar panels, which uh, is nice because you can hook that directly up to a battery. You don't, I mean, they say to put a charge controller in there because you want again, 12 consistent volts. So you can, but you don't have to, if you're in a pinch, um, you may get a something like 23 volt or 24 volt um, solar panel. You can have a 48 volt solar panel. You can have a 60 volt solar panel. So those are the things that you're looking for on the back. Those you're going to, again, put through your charge controller. Your charge controller is going to be based off of um, your solar panels, what's coming in and what's going out. So charge controllers will say that they can convert, let's say, 48 volts to 12 volts. And it'll have 12 volts coming out. Some of them are selectable. So they'll have like a little pin that you can say, I want 12 volts going out, or I want 24 volts going out, or I want 48 volts going out. Um, but right now we're just talking about 12. So you just turn that to 12 and you'll have 12 volts coming in, 12 volts going out, or whatever voltage is coming in and you'll have 12 volts going out. So you may have a 24 volt panel um, that's hooked up and you'll have a 12 volt panel out. 
but I dropped it in link and it'll tell you, it should give you the, tell you the breakdown. Are all the panels that you're talking about the same exact panels or are they like modge podge? They're the, they're the same. They're like about, I would say eight of them all together. Okay. And my, my son just dropped them off and I'm like, what the heck, you know, but at the same time, I was like, well, I can't throw it away because I don't know what I'm throwing away or what I'm actually like at in front of me. Yeah, and yeah. so, so then I was thinking, well, maybe I could put it like on a mobile unit, you know, kind of like hook them together, but I don't know how to do that either. And so I thought, well, I can always go to the school because I mean, there's a, a university here and I'm sure there's somebody that knows what the heck they are and how to put them together. But the more I'm involved with this whole project, I start thinking, well, heck, I can just make a, a grid and then other people can use it, you know, um, in our community. And there might be other people that are doing, have the same thing because like any kind of project, you get people that leave stuff all the time at the sites. And, you know, some people are conscious of what they're disposing. Other people just kind of put it away in the garage and figure like, well, one day I might have to replace one. So here's the extra panel or whatever. But if people were aware of what they actually had, they would be able to, you know, glean and create energy within their homes so they could like have a backup in case something does happen. How long ago did your son drop those off? Um, what about seven, seven months ago, eight months ago? And they're just sitting outside. So I don't know if do they go bad or or no, no, they're, like they're easy. I was just trying to I was trying to ballpark what the size are. So seven months ago, they're probably like 400 watt panels. And if you have eight of those, that's 3,200 watts, which is the the normal consumption for a four, sorry, a three family home. Um, so that's right well, around, okay. yeah, three kilowatts is right around what a three to four family home uses a day. So you could take that and hook it up to an, you know, solar panels, hook them up to an inverter, plug those into your wall, plug the inverter, like literally into one of your, your sockets in your wall. Um, and basically your, some meters turn backwards, some meters don't, some, they just, they just stop turning, but basically you're paying for your, you're taking care of your own power supply. So it's, it's like a solar system. That's kind of the same thing, but yeah, it does that's definitely. Like, have that's bizarre. It's it's yeah. like so bizarre, but that technology is like every, I mean, it's available, but like if I wouldn't have learned about this program, there wouldn't have been, been a real reason for me to even delve into trying to understand this because it's like cool. And it's, it's really like uh, kind of like regenerative in the sense that like you, you didn't realize you had all this resource in within your hands and reach and I'm not the only one. So that's, it excites me because I think, wow, if I can get more people that come out and say, well, we have that, you know, or we're kind of wondering what that is or, you know, how do we explore that? And so I just really want to thank you because even just these conversations, it's good for um, for like uh, provocative thinking in community just to say, hey, what do we have? What is our power analysis within our own community and the scape of, of uh, who, are, who, who we're connected to? Yeah, well said. <laughs> I think and that's actually a great closeout, I think, honestly. Thank you, Martha, for that. Uh, I will hand it over to Tom. I know you had something you wanted to address before. Yeah. So, you and know, as you mentioned, we're we're getting really close to the end. Uh, we just have one more session. And so I, I mentioned earlier about the kind of homework uh, between sessions, uh, between this one and the next one. And so the next thing um, that we'll that we'll be kind of working on over the course of this week um, is to create um, outlines for your your launch plans. Uh, so I've created a template. Uh, it's just five questions to be able to fill out. Um, you should be able to make a copy of this and you know put your city, region, whatever whatever your scope is, which is one of the questions down below. Um, and so you can just kind of title it as such. And then um, we'll be going over them um, in the next session. Uh, so any other questions that come up, are there any other barriers to, to launch? Um, what have you, we'll, we'll be discussing on that. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, it will be necessary to create your plan um, and to be able to submit it in order for us then to send you the, the battery request form. Um, so please work through those over the, the next week. 
And as you have questions coming up, I'm going to post this in the discussion forum and everything later this evening. Um, but as there's questions and everything about the form, you can either uh, put them in Canvas or you can email me directly. Um, and I'll make sure that those questions get routed to the right folks if there's technical questions or anything else like that. So um, please do find that link that is put in the chat. Uh, I can see a few folks are jumping into it already. And like I said, I'll be sending out the summary once we have the recording uh, for the session um, along with this form as the homework. Cool. Thank you, Tom. And thank yeah. you, everyone. I thank you for continuing to be engaging with just uh, and thinking about it, talking with your community. The possibilities are really endless when you start talking and figuring out what your community could possibly be and how you want to collectively resolve decisions. So it's very exciting to hear all of your questions and um, everyone engaging with their communities. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Peace out, everyone. All right. We'll see you next time, everyone. One more class, one more session, one more gathering. <laughs> Peace. Peace, everyone.